the movie Bohemian Rhapsody was released on November 3, 2018, and the fascinating story behind one of the most influential groups ever continues to be unbelievably popular. However, some things shown in the movie kind of differ from the truth. So, do you want to find out more about the shooting process and the true life story of Freddie Mercury and Queen? Then keep watching! Before you learn more fun facts about the movie and the band, be sure to hit subscribe and ring this little notification bell right there to join us on the bright side. Number 1. The creators built an exact copy of Wembley Stadium for the movie. Do you remember the scene with the iconic Live Aid performance? Well, it took way more preparation than you think. The creators of the movie had to make a replica of the 1985 version of the stadium on an airfield in London, since it simply doesn't exist anymore. Moreover, the director of Live Aid was present during filming and was pleasantly surprised with how precise the reconstruction was. No wonder it seems so realistic in the movie. Number 2. The Pepsi glasses you see on the piano weren't a product placement. When the movie came out, some people pointed out that the creators added some very visible Pepsi product placement in the movie during the Live Aid scene. However, this couldn't be more false. If you watch the original performance, you'll see these glasses on Mercury's piano too. And as the whole performance was filmed in compliance with the smallest aspects, right down to the air kiss Freddie Mercury sent to his mother from the stage, the creators decided to leave this little detail in its rightful place. Number 3. Queen didn't have any doubts about performing at Live A. In the movie, we see the members of Queen seriously hesitating about whether they should perform at Live Aid at all. And this seems completely reasonable, since preparing for a huge concert that would be seen all over the world can't be done in just two weeks after a long break. But the true story is way less poetic than that. The pause in Queen's work didn't last for more than a year. Plus, in February 1984, they released a new album called The Works. After that, they went on a big tour and were completely ready to rock out at Live Aid. Number 4. Some of the vocal recordings for the film were done by Mark Martell. The Canadian singer Mark Martell had some serious involvement in the behind-the-scenes prep for the movie. And it isn't at all surprising that the singer was chosen for vocal recordings, rehearsals, and improvisations. Several years ago, Mark sent his cover versions of Queen songs to guitarist Brian May and drummer Roger Taylor. They were amazed by the similarities between Mark's voice and Freddie's, and even created a tribute project called Queen Extravaganza back in 2012 in which Mark performed. So it basically came full circle for Mark and Queen. 5. Mike Myers had previously appeared in a film listening to Bohemian Rhapsody. Do you remember the moment when the EMI executive listens to Bohemian Rhapsody and isn't digging it at all? Not that many people know that this scene was Mike Myers' special queen full circle as well. The actor, famous for his many roles, including Austin Powers, already listened to and even sang Bohemian Rhapsody in character in the movie Wayne's World. Who would have thought at that time that he would be a part of the Queen movie later, right? Life is truly unpredictable. Number 6. Queen didn't break the contract with EMI. While we're on the topic of this scene, there's one little mistake there as well. Of course, Queen did have some disagreements with EMI during the Night at the Opera era. Still, everything seemed to turn out alright since the band released many more albums with this label. So, no contract breaking actually happened. Number 7. Bohemian Rhapsody should have been directed by someone else. The first person to take the director's chair was Brian Singer, and he was actively working on the movie almost from the start. But 20th Century Fox decided to fire him, owing to a number of disagreements with Queen participants and Rami Malek. After that, it was Dexter Fletcher who brilliantly finished the biopic. Number 8. Freddie became part of the band through Tim Staffel. In the movie, we see Freddie meeting Roger and Brian after a concert when their frontman, Tim Staffel, decides to leave the project. But it wasn't exactly like that in real life. 
Back in 1965, long before Queen was formed, Tim Staffel began a graphics and drawing course at Aileen Art College, where he quickly became friends with Mercury. After some time, Staffel, Brian May, and Roger Taylor formed a band called Smile. However, Tim later decided to pursue a career as a model maker, designer, and animator, and he left the band. That was the moment when Mercury came in and took his place. And with John Deacon entering the band, they became the group that we all know and love today. Number 9. We Will Rock You was written much earlier. According to the movie, guitarist Brian May composes We Will Rock You, one of the band's biggest hits, during a rehearsal that took place in 1980. Right after this scene, we see fragments of the band's big concert at Madison Square Garden. In reality, this smashing hit appeared in Queen's hit album News of the World back in 1977, several years before the actual concert. So the fans enjoyed this jam of a song way earlier. Number 10. Freddie Mercury wasn't the only one who tried to go solo. Another brilliant and emotional scene in the film includes the discord in the band that started with Mercury's solo album contracts. According to the script, the rest of the band don't share Freddie's aspirations for something new and ask him not to leave the band. Still, the frontman insists on his new direction, and Roger Taylor tells him the heartbreaking phrase, you've just killed Queen. In reality, pretty much every participant of Queen was trying to make their own solo albums work. Moreover, Roger Taylor himself recorded a solo single back in 1978 and released his Fun in Space album in 1981. So Freddie's ambitions definitely didn't hurt the band. Number 11. Freddie Mercury didn't know he was sick until 1987. Toward the end of the movie, shortly before the legendary performance, Freddie, played by the magnificent Rami Malek, announces to his band members that he is HIV positive. This scene makes an emotional and raw ending. Nonetheless, things went completely differently in reality. In 1986, rumors of Mercury's illness started spreading. But it was only in 1989 that fans started to notice changes in his appearance. The musician himself denied the rumors until November 22, 1991, when he released a public statement to confirm he was HIV positive and had AIDS. Just over 24 hours after issuing this statement, Freddie Mercury died at his home in Kensington. Number 12. The official soundtrack includes previously unreleased songs. If you're a real fan of the movie or the band, then you probably already have the soundtrack. But if not, you should certainly go and get it, since it's a real treasure for any Queen lover. The official soundtrack of the movie contains not only several famous songs we all know by heart, but another 11 recordings that had not been released. So whether you decide to watch the movie one more time or listen to their songs, I guess we can all agree that Queen will always be a huge part of worldwide music history. So. What part of the movie did you like the most? Tell us in the